for uh, from the lactating consultant. I have very impressive of the role of the lactating consultant, and uh, I uh, thank particularly uh, Miriam with uh, all this uh, science of uh, human milk and and also uh, the mother and uh, and the baby's uh, contact and uh, it's uh, multiple uh, 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 she, 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 she use uh, uh, laptop she use uh, uh, video she use its uh, person to convince uh, all the people to the uh, good uh, uh, good effect of uh, human milk and uh, uh, breastfeeding the most uh, longer. Uh, in, unfortunately, in France, there is only uh, 30 percent who uh, breastfeeding in uh, four months uh, of uh, of of life, and. Uh, Plus, uh, I advance in, the, in my research, and plus, I am convinced that uh, human milk be uh, longer than six months, if possible. To you, uh, the speak. Uh, excuse me to to, to have uh, uh, keep the uh, this five minutes. That's okay, Claude. Well, um, well. Miriam, sorry, just yes. let me introduce the, pres the the title of your presentation because I didn't oh. do that, and I think I I think I should do that because uh, it's important that we that we bring ourselves back to these first thousand days uh, and and let everyone know that as they can see, I hope everybody has it on their screen um, that uh, Miriam's title today is the first thousand days of life. Um, uh, the focus on breastfeeding in the first thousand uh, days. So I'm really looking forward to, to hearing your presentation, Miriam, to hearing your voice, seeing your face, uh, and um, I'm hoping that there'll be time for some discussion afterwards. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. So thank you, Claude, for inviting me to this conference. I'm delighted to, to present, uh, to talk about the subject with which I'm passionate about, and thank you, Julian, for your uh, for your presentation of uh, my really life. You know, <laughs> so um, uh, so as a lactation consultant, um, I will focus in this presentation on the crucial importance of breastfeeding over the course of the first thousand days of life highlighting the preventing effect on non-communicative diseases and as a key element for better brain development. So to begin with, I'd like to say that I have no conflict of interest to declare in this presentation. And as an international lactation consultant, I have permission to protect, promote, and support breastfeeding in the respect of infants' rights and parents' wishes. Uh, there will be three parts in this presentation. Uh, first of all, uh, I will explain what this concept of the first thousand days really means. And uh, um, or, although I know that yesterday we talked a lot about it, but I will maybe give another insight. Um, and um, afterward, I will demonstrate, um, if I can, why breastfeeding plays a vital role in this time span. And finally, I will draw your attention on um, several measures that could be taken in order to promote and support breastfeeding uh, efficiently. Uh, so what are the first thousand days of life? Well, UNICEF, the United Nations International Children's Emergency Fund, uh, which you know is, has been crea was created in 1946, and whose main mission is to protect children's rights all around the world, took the lead and launched a campaign in 2010 
with a focus on early intervention for a better chance in life for every child. Hence the concept of the first thousand days, which correspond roughly to the duration of a pregnancy. So the conception, gestation and birth, which is about 270 days for full term baby. And the first two years of infant life, which is 730 days. This is for the calculation. Uh, so the main goals of this global campaign was are twofold. First is to fight malnutrition among women and children. And secondly, is to encourage positive interactions of parents with their, with their infants in order to ensure a better brain development. So with a good start in life, inequalities among children could therefore be minimized. So this is part of a preventive medicine program which focuses on promotion, protection, and maintenance of health and well-being, as well as prevention of disease and premature death. This program includes parenting education and public health actions. And the slogan chosen by UNICEF in 2010 to promote this program was eat, play, and love. This, this reminds me of the title of Ryan Murphy's excellent film featuring Julia Roberts in 2010 called Eat, Pray, and Love, which is an adaptation of a book written by uh, the American novelist Elizabeth Gilbert in 2008. So maybe UNICEF thought that that title of the book was quite good for a for naming their program. I don't know. <laughs> um, so first of all, I'd like to concentrate on one of the main goals of the campaign, which is the fight against malnutrition. Malnutrition, which is a, a real killer. So maybe we should uh, define what malnutrition is. So this is a non-adequate food intake, but it can have several forms. So there, are, there is undernutrition, which is a lack of food, also called starvation, either chronic or acute, due to poverty, wars, land devastation, or severe illness of a person. There is overnutrition, which is too much food, which on the contrary is an overload, as you said, of food, leading to high body and mass index and obesity. And this is quite epidemic nowadays. Um, and the latter form of malnutrition is micronutrient deficiency. It corresponds to a lack of important vitamins and minerals in the diet. And this is often referred to as the hidden hunger as an example, I, I could say that two thirds of non-elderly adults suffer from anemia, which is a lack of iron, especially women, which, as you know, can be a problem during pregnancy and postpartum period. Uh, I would like to put forward this quotation of the father of medicine, Hippocrates. Let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food to highlight the importance of nutrition as a key fact factor for good health. We are, we are actually witnessing an incredible rise of non-communicative diseases all around the world for the last decades. Here, here is a list of uh, the, the most common ones. We saw them yesterday as well. So diabetes, cardiovascular diseases, diseases, cancers, allergies, chronic respiratory diseases, arthritis, all inflammatory bowel disease, Alzheimer's disease as well. So, um, and healthy behaviors like the use of tobacco, harmful drugs, alcohol, physical inactivity, and poor diets increase the risks of dying from an ECD. And actually, poor diet can start 
at the beginning of life during the first thousand days, well explained in yesterday's presentations. Un instant. So NCD kill around. Encore un peu de patience. Uh, sorry, uh, this is my computer talking to me. <laughs> so NCDs kill around 40 million people each year in the world. And um, half of, of this, um, these people are dying from CVD, so cardiovascular disease, which is real killer. Quarter of them are from cancer, four million from respiratory diseases, one and a half million from diabetes, and the rest supposedly from autoimmune diseases or disorders. In relation um, to our topic of the first thousand days, uh, we could point out the importance of addressing the issue of malnutrition among women of reproductive age. In fact, one billion women suffer from malnutrition around the world. We could ask ourselves why women are more at risk than men. We can't deny the impact on some cultural practices which favor boys over girls in their basic nutri nutritional needs. Moreover, women of reproductive age are more prone to anemia due to menstrual cycles. Yet we know that pregnancy has a huge load on the body and requires a good balance of nutrients as explained by Claude Bio in his presentation yesterday. So if the woman is undernourished or ill-nourished, and on top of that, lives in a stressful or polluted environment, it can have a serious impact on the fetus with a risk of intrauterine growth restriction, we talked about also yesterday, genetic disorders, and a high risk of prematurity. More nutrition during the first thousand days put the infant at risk of impaired brain development with a lower IQ, poorer immune system, which make it prone to diseases in the short term and long term. So how to prevent this problem? Well, education is the key with early interventions in schools, and also uh, in parenting classes, in children's centers or health clinics, in the community. Um, and for women, especially uh, screening and uh, um, some one-to-one -one or group um, of uh, information uh, during before conception, during pregnancy, and also after birth for support. Um, so, as I said, you know, um, this intervention would be to reduce sex inequalities with better treatment of girls and information about how to get to a good balanced diet with simple local food. And Moreover, screening of women of reproductive age should be automatically performed to identify those suffering from malnutrition and needing supplementation for a safer pregnancy, especially with iron, folic acid, calcium, and vitamin D. We can explain the great incidence of NCDs partly with the microbiome effect. So first of all, let me recall some definition. The microbiota is a community of microorganisms such as bacteria, fungi, viruses, protozoa, and archaea that inhabit a particular environment. Our body hosts between 10 trillion and 100 trillion of them from over 1,000 different species on the skin, in the gastrointestinal tract, in the urine. The urogenital system, in the nose, mouth, lungs, etc. And the most 
well studied population of microorganisms is in our gut, also known uh, as gut flora. The microbiome refers to the collective genomes of these microorganisms in a given environment, which means all their genetic material, DNA and RNA. And I would refer you to Virginie, Virginie Rigour, um, brilliant presentation about epigenetics yesterday. The human superorganism which is the title of a book written by Dr. Rodney D. Dieter, who is a specialist of uh, the microbiomes. Is it, he says that it is a unique, that uh, this human super, that, that microbioma is unique for each individual. It constitutes our own identity, like fingerprints. And its complex composition depends on gestation, birth, conditions, birth conditions, I mean, mode of, of birth or delivery, vaginal or C-section, early body contacts, being breastfed or not, the environment, the stress, the medication, lifestyle, diet, smoking, alcohol, drugs, physical exercise, et cetera, et cetera. So a rich and diverse microbiome will have a positive influence on our metabolism and immune system. So in fact, the most critical moment, as we saw also yesterday, for the foundation of the human microbiome is around childbirth. This is when the colonization party starts, as Tony Harmon calls it. Tony Harmon, um, is, um, she, she, she wrote books and also she produced um, a very interesting documentary film called Microbirth. And it explains in details how the baby's birth affects his future health. So let me summarize. We know that the baby during this gestation develops in a near sterile environment. We, we're still not sure about that. And around the end of the pregnancy, the mother's vaginal microbiome becomes increasingly rich in certain bacteria which will start colonizing the baby's skin, eyes, ears, nose, mouth, once, once in the birth canal. These bacteria are mainly lactobacilli, which are very beneficial and protective for the baby. So during the process of a vaginal birth, the baby will also be in contact with microbes from the mother's fecal matter, like bifidobacteria. Just after birth, if skin to skin is initiated, the seeding will continue with the bacteria present on the mother's skin. The baby being touched by other people, like hospital stuff, for example, will also acquire some other microbes. So all these bacteria entering the baby's gut will then need to be fed to grow nicely. Hence the question of the milk the baby will receive. As we'll see later, breast milk is the perfect food as it contains special complex sugars to nourish all these microorganisms, which industrial substitutes don't have. So as the baby develops from a newborn to a toddler, its microbiome evolves. It reaches its equilibrium, a sort of baseline state, between the age of two and three. It's important to mention that 60 to 70% remain the same until old age. It's a key element for good or bad health. And the remaining 30 or 40% may be altered from diet lack of exercise, stress, toxic exposure, medication, especially antibiotics, surgery, etc. So the building up of the immune system is directly linked to the constitution of the microbiome. Let's see now what would be the worst case scenario for the infant during that window of the first thousand days. 
imagine that before getting pregnant, the future mother has a rather unhealthy way of life. She smokes, takes sometimes recreational drugs, drinks alcohol regularly, eats mainly fast food, doesn't do much sport. She might be overweight with, with a sort of dysbiosis, intestinal dysbiosis, or lacking important micronutrients. She's now expecting a baby. She's under stress, either in environmental, personal, or professional, or a combination of the three. Her baby doesn't develop properly, properly in utero. She then gives birth prematurely with an emergency C-section. So the baby doesn't benefit from the vaginal and intestinal microbes, important for an optimal seeding process. And on top of this, there might be antibiotics used very early. Moreover, skin to skin doesn't occur due to emergency care. So the first feed doesn't happen. And to finish this nightmare scenario, the mother has decided not to breastfeed. And of course, when the, the and uh, of course, when the solids are introduced around six months or maybe before, she turns to industrial baby food as a logical continuation. Consequently, this baby with a poor microbiome from the start of life will see his immune system altered and his brain developing in a non-optimal way. Therefore, he will be more prone to infectious diseases and more at risk of contracting NCDs later in life. So I'm now going to develop the second part of my presentation, which is why breastfeeding represents such a window of opportunity for better health. And I would add better health for the infant and for the mother. Well, first of all, and it should be quite obvious for everyone, <laughs> breastfeeding is the biological norm. It is the normal way of feeding babies. It is the natural continuum from pregnancy through birth, then breastfeeding. This is part of our mammalian heritage. Human milk for human babies, cow's milk for baby cows, cat's milk for kitten, elephant's milk for baby elephants, rabbit's milk for baby rabbits, etc., etc. Milk is species specific, and we can actually distinguish four types of mammals, four of, of mammals according to the macronutrients composition of their milk. And we can say nest mammals, cash mammals, follow mammals, and carry mammals. The nest mammals are the puppy, I mean, the dogs and cats, for instance, cash mammals are the deers, the rabbits, um, follow rabbits, uh, follow mammals, sorry, are uh, like cows or elephants or uh, all these, these animals which are quite mature at birth and can, can walk. And the carry mammals, we are part of the carry mammals like apes as well and kangaroo. We are the most immature mammals of, uh, of all. So we need special milk and special care. Um, uh, I will now go through key points which make breast milk so unique and precious for babies. So um, it is perfectly balanced to satisfy all the baby's nutritional needs according to his age, and we talked about it yesterday at all. So there is absolutely no risk of, of um, malnutrition for uh, um, for a thriving breastfed baby. Um, we, we, we talked about yet yesterday, so I'm not going to, to go through all this, which was we talked about the changes of milk from colostrum, uh, the first breast food rich in protein, vitamins, minerals, and oligosaccharides, to transitional milk during the course of the first week, postpartum, then to mature milk after about a month after birth. Uh, so each mother's milk is tailor-made. It's tailored to nourish and protect her own baby. 
even if she doesn't have herself a per perfect diet, her body will prioritize her baby's needs. And I refer you to Claude Bio's presentation about what breastfeeding mothers are recommended to eat for optimal health and to prevent exhaustion and, um, and uh, also malnutrition uh, of, of, of the, the third part that I mentioned before, which is the micronutrients uh, deficiency. I would, I would just mention the, the importance of variety and good quality lipids in, in her diet. So apart from all the macronutrients and micronutrients, so the vitamins and minerals, breast milk is a living fluid. So it contains powerful bioactive components like hormones, growth factors, enzymes, leptin for CCT, I don't can't pronounce that word, um, lipase, lactase, etc., etc., antibodies, anti-inflammatory, and antibacterial uh, factors. All these components interact with each other in a very complex way in order to support the immune system and the brain development of the infant. I could say that breastfeed, breast milk is safe, is sanitary, environmentally friendly, as Virginie Rigaud um, uh, said yesterday as well. Um, it's sustainable and uh, renewable. It's a renewable source of nutrition and it's absolutely free. So it's very important for, uh, for mothers um, from, um, from like uh, economically um, uh, in a social uh, environment, which can't provide them, can't, sorry, which can't make uh, them buy uh, other milk. Um, so um, breast milk also, I could say is not, sterile. It contains special strains of bacteria, mainly uh, by bifidobacteria, which will enrich the baby's microbiome, as we said before. Uh, more and more scientists believe in the existence of an enteromammary pathway, which would explain actually the presence of bacteria in breast milk. And I, I could refer you to a recent publication um, made in February 2021 uh, in the review Nutrients, and it's written by Juan Rodriguez, Leonides Fernandez, and Valerie Verhasselt, and it's called The Gut-Breast Axis, Programming Health for Life. It's a very interesting paper. Um, um, yeah, I, I'll just talk a little bit about HMO. The human milk bacteria will also be fed thanks to the presence in the breast milk of complex sugars called HMO, human milk oligosaccharide. They play an important role in the constitution of neonatal gut flora as Javier Aston Cabell explained in his pres presentation yesterday. They represent the third most important component in breast milk after lactose and lipids and uh, more than 100 HMO have been identified and we notice differences between mothers. Um, and HMO concentration depends also on the stage of lactation. Finally, the mere act of breastfeeding represents a very rich sensory experience for the baby. And once the mother has become confident and comfortable, the frequent release of feel-good hormones, mainly oxytocin, will contribute to, her, to um, the development of a secure attachment leading to a healthy emotional brain development. Breastfeeding can be a very satisfying and empowering experience for the mother. And as such, we could say that this is also a window of opportunity for emotional well-being of the mother. Um, I'm not going to go through all that slide. This is just an informative poster representing the composition of breast milk. Um, um, there are a few things which are missing, of course, it's not exhaustive. 
uh, I, I would just say that breast milk is such a complex cocktail of thousands of bioactive elements working together that it is, of course, impossible to have it replicate. Scientists are actually still discovering new interactions and implications of human milk in medicine. I could cite, for instance, Hamlet, uh, which was discovered in 2008 by Swedish scientists with a combination of a protein and lipid, uh, which have the power to kill cancerous cells. We could also cite the presence of stem cells in breast milk which is also very important, could be very important in medicine. So to illustrate how important breastfeeding is in terms of health, let me quote Caesar Victoria in The Lancet. Um, and when I, will I will let you reflect on that. <laughs> so findings from epidemiology and biology studies substantiate the fact that the decision to not breastfeed a child has major long-term effects on the health, nutrition, and development of the child, and on women's health. Possibly no other health behavior can affect such varied outcomes in the two individuals who are involved, the mother and the child. I could just add that the benefits of breastfeeding for mother and child are dose dependent. The longer, the better. <laughs> So let's see quickly uh, what can happen if the infant is not breastfed. So this is a British poster linked to UNICEF baby friendly initiative. Uh, so um, it's, it benefits the baby from top to toe. Uh, this is a very simple drawing, um, but it's quite illustrative of uh, the effect of uh, not breastfeeding. So it can, it can increase the risk of ear infections, otitis media. It can increase the risk of tooth decay, dental occlusion, chest infections, diarrhea, vomiting, death from gut infection in sick and premature babies. Uh, we talk about neck. Um, and of course, on the long term, uh, it can have overweight uh, risks or obesity later in life. Um, uh, we could also cite the, 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 the increased risk of uh, sudden infant death if a baby is not breastfed. Uh, mother and babies are not um, really uh, connected if uh, the mother is not lactating. There is also evidence to suggest that uh, there may be a very uh, strong link between breastfeeding and educational attainment. And, um, and as I said before, well, there is a great um, um, impact on the breast, on the baby's brain development. Um, so these are a few figures um, um, which, are, which come from uh, meta-analysis. Um, and uh, um, so we say 26 percent. Uh, if if a baby is breastfed, there is 26 percent of reduction in risk of overweight, and um, uh, uh, sorry, and obesity later in life. A 35 percent reduction of risk in risk of type two diabetes. A 90 percent reduction of risk in in childhood leukemia, which is the most prevalent childhood cancer. And um, as I will say before, uh, afterward, there is evidence supporting benefits against CVD for both mother and 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 child. Uh, here is another British poster, which partly illustrates the health benefits of breastfeeding for mothers. There's a good evidence that breastfeeding decreases the risk of breast cancer, the breast attaining its ph physiological maturity when lactating. So breastfeeding also protects against ovarian cancer. Uh, an Australian study has shown that mothers of three uh, having breastfed for a total of at least um, 31 months, have 91% less risk of developing an ovarian cancer. So in the last decade, studies have also demonstrated the potential benefits of breastfeeding in reducing the risks of chronic inflammatory diseases. And I would personally illustrate this uh, with a case study of a mother that I have supported. So I could say that her name is Sherry and she's a 38 year old 
She was diagnosed with Crohn's uh, disease at the age of 18. And she went through several treatments, one year, for an, one year of corticoids, antibodies, um, uh, Remicade in infusion, an operation of several fistula, and even a surgical removal of 50 centimeters of the intestine with a colostomy bag kept for three months in 2007. The disease still continued afterward with heavy diarrhea, vomiting, headaches, joint pain, and she eventually got pregnant nine years later, keeping her treatment for the first two trimester. And then she then gave birth to her first baby one month prematurely. She decided to express her milk so that he could be exclusively breastfed. And she continued partly at the breast and partly with bottles of breast milk once at home. Her doctors were reluctant to let her continue breastfeeding because of her condition, while in fact, she was in full remission of her disease. And she continued to express her milk until her son was about 21 months old, is now almost four years old, and she still hasn't had any more inflammatory episodes. So this is amazing. Uh, breastfeeding, in fact, improves the woman's metabolism and protects her from NCDs, among which cardiovascular disease. Breastfeeding is also a relationship based on closeness and loving interactions, which diminish the risks of postnatal depression. So this takes us naturally to the oxytocin factor. The, the, the tocin effect of breastfeeding. Um, Kirsten Öfnes Moberg is um, a, a, a very well, she is the world specialist of oxytocin. She is a Swiss, Swedish scientist. She has dedicated most of her life to it and I actually invite you to read her brilliant book, The Hormone of, of Closeness, uh, The Role of Oxytocin in uh, Relationships. A human baby needs primarily, as we say, we are carry mammal, to be close to her mom, to smell her skin, to feel her warmth, to gaze at her, to hear her voice in order to feel secure and thrive. During childbirth, the mother gradually secretes more and more oxytocin, which triggers strong contractions, leading to the passage of the baby from womb to word. The author mentions the fact that an epidural or a C-section can affect the normal release of oxytocin. And as she says, and I quote, it is only after a period of lactation that the mother will develop the oxytocin dependent maternal adaptations. The first meeting with her child is usually like love at first sight, especially if there is skin to skin. Oxytocin is then flowing, stress hormones diminish, heart rates stabilize, breathing is regulated, the bonding party starts, uh, this is my word, bonding party, <laughs> and will continue through breastfeeding. Milk letdowns occur only when the release of oxytocin, with the release of oxytocin, which responds to the baby's touch and suckling. Within the first hour after birth, most healthy newborn, if non-disturbed, start suckling, sucking their hands, licking their mother's body and reach for the breast, guided by smell and other sensory stimulus. This is the power of skin to skin. And the frequent body contacts that breastfeeding involves makes it a very sensory experience for both mother and child. And the repetitive release of oxytocin and prolactin have long lasting calming and bonding effects. This is less just like the chemistry, the mysterious chemistry of love. To summarize on the slide, this importance of breastfeeding in the first thousand days, I've decided to play with the letters B and F. It works quite well in English for easier memorization. So breastfeeding is baby friendly. Breastfeeding matters. It's food for the brain. 
with the, it, it, uh, it impacts the connective development and the emotional developments of the child. It's food for the body. It optimizes health. And, um, it, uh, and it contributes to a great immunity system. Niels Bergman, uh, and, and I quote underneath, um, uh, Niels Bergman, who is a very well-known Swedish specialist in neuroscience and uh, one of the founders of the kangaroo uh, mother care movement and a promoter of skin-to-skin -skin contact between a mother and her newborn. And I had the privilege to hear him talk at the UNICEF conference I was attending in 2005. And he said that breastfeeding is a good way to eat, but 90% of what is happening is brain development. Breastfeeding equals brain wiring for the, for the baby and for the mother too. The baby is altering the mother's mind. The whole brain changes and becomes quite uh, uh, resilient. Thank you. I come now to the third, and I will go quite, um, quickly to the third part of my presentation, um, which is, um, oops, sorry, I have something in my, uh, 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 uh. Uh, oops, 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 oops. I'm sorry, I have, I have like, yeah, which is how to effectively promote breastfeeding. Uh, there is a strong link between early interventions antenatally and postnatally and positive outcomes. So I would uh, say that parents need, uh, first of all, to understand the health hazards of formula feeding, to be aware of, um, uh, um, of the lack of breastfeeding training among medical staff and to be supported and share their experience with other parents uh, in groups and support groups. And they could talk about the fact that they're tired they're lonely, they're worried, they help, feel helpless. So sharing is very important for the continuation also of, of uh, caring for a young baby. Um, the second uh, important uh, aspect would be to review hospital practices uh, with a priority of individualization of, of care. And I would say uh, for, for doctors, um, they would always have this in mind is primum non nocere. First, do no harm. So the balance of risks and benefits is rarely taken into account when newborns are routinely given top-ups of formula in the maternity ward, especially during the second night after birth. Medical staff minimize the impact of this common practice and uh, it actually undermines new mother's ability uh, to, to, um, uh, or, or new mother's uh, confidence. And um, while they should be reassured and well supported at a time when they feel uh, most vulnerable. Close contacts between mother and baby during the first few days of metabolic adaptation for the newborn should be emphasized in every maternity ward. And uh, I would also add that uh, there sh we should normalize breastfeeding in public places with posters, art exhibition, video clips, scenes in cinema, TV series, and on the opposite as well, reduce drastically or ban even like some country did, did uh, formula marketing, which has a huge influence on, 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 on parents to be. Um, uh, um, I, I know that uh, we don't have much time, so I'm not going to go through all this um, because we, you, I just um, um, just would like to recall the recommendations, but most of you must know about it. And um, uh, as Claude said as well, uh, although we have uh, good recommendations with the WHO, only one out of three infants worldwide is breastfed exclusively for breast for six months. And breastfeeding rates fall drastically from birth to hospital discharge. For instance, in France, uh, after a week, um, it, it go from seven, 60, 70% to 50%. 
of uh, be babies being breastfed at the hospital uh, discharge. And it continues to fall gradually when women return to work. So why? So uh, we have cultural practices, uh, old midwife tales, ignorance, uh, the pers personal history. That's why also um, um, individualization of care is very important uh, during pregnancy as well. Uh, the influence of breast milk substitute companies, it's a powerful marketing strategies uh, and there's no respect for, for some of them of the international code which uh, celebrated its 40th birthday this year. Um, I could mention um, these figures, but you could see it on the screen as well. Uh, and, uh, and I also, also say that uh, in reality, there is a lack of proper training and support in hospital and in the community. So um, uh, in my private practice, I'm doing all my best to empower parents in their breastfeeding plan. And uh, I, I really enjoy when they find experience rewarding and enriching on a personal point of view. Um, and they, they feel good actually knowing that their baby can benefit from the most valuable gift, good health. And it's better than, than money in the bank, I would say. Uh, I usually focus on three main keys to help them reach a positive experience of breastfeeding with um, lower stress levels. Um, first of all, the confidence, so physical and mental. It's important for the woman to trust her body to produce enough milk, because a lot of them think they're not going to have enough milk. Um, uh, and um, um, so she, she really needs to trust her body. And, uh, and also she needs to know key points on the physiology of lactation and baby's needs. It's also crucial that she develops a true determination, motivation. And I'm, I'm talking about friends here because I'm supporting French moms mainly. Uh, because she might be confronted to contradictory advice or even undermining comments. In, of course, we are in a country where breastfeeding is not the norm. Um, so being convinced that every problem has a solution will definitely help as well. The second key is comfort, physical and mental. The way the mother sits and lie down to feed her baby is really not to be neglected. It can either help or hinder the baby to attach properly to the breast. The lead bag breastfeeding, also named as biological nurturing, by Susan Koster, and this is the picture from her last book, uh, uh, translated in French, and it's called L'Allaitement Instinctif. Uh, it reduces mother's tensions by providing full support to her back. It opens up her body to create space for her baby to lay down comfortably on his front, with his feet touching his mother's body or, or a pillow if she has a C-section and it's for her she's scared of having the baby on her scar. Uh, that way, the baby feels stabilized, secure, and gravity helps him stay in place without any effort. Any effort and it really stimulates the baby's um, primitive uh, reflexes. And if oxytocin flows that way, the mother will also feel comfortable in her mind, acquiring a growing serenity, especially if her partner is supportive. And she will become oxytocin, as Susan puts it. Yes, sorry. Yes. Miriam, can we, can you draw to a close, please? Yes, of course. It, it is just the last thing, the connection, and then I've, I'm, I'm just finishing. Yes. <laughs> yes. I didn't realize it was long. <laughs> so the third, the third key point, the key, the, the key for successful breastfeeding, I would say is connection, physical and mental. I often recommend the mother to be connected to her body because it's doing such a great job. Breast massage, for example, will help relieve congestion and avoid severe engorgement in the early times of breastfeeding. Sometimes it can happen depending on, on the, the delivery mode. If she, depend, if she spends a lot of time holding, touching her baby, communicating verbally and non-verbally, she will become connected in a very positive way, instinctively responding to its needs and feelings. 
not waiting for his crying to start a feed, for example, not looking at the watch, savoring the time spent with her baby. And being also connected with other breastfeeding moms will definitely be a great support for him, for her. Um, so this, uh, I'm just finishing on two slides and this slide, I'm not gonna go through all that, but this is the type of uh, poster that we could, we could put in, in, in um, um, medical practices or, uh, or other, other parts where people could see it, the differences between <laughs> breast milk and, and formula milk, you know, uh, it's quite uh, illustrative. And uh, so in my, this is my last slide. Uh, I, I just wanted to, to, to share with you some pictures of, of some mums that, I, that I, I, I supported. And the last one is not, of course, obviously you can see it's in black and white and uh, it's quite old, but um, it shows that breastfeeding was at the time very, um, 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 very common uh, in public places. So it is urgent to protect, promote and support breastfeeding for it has to start in life. All children deserve the best beginning. It is their right to be breastfed. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Miriam. That was, that was such a wonderful broad exploration of the, of the subject. So that was, um, that was perfect. Thank you. If you'd like to stop sharing your screen, um, uh, and uh, then um, whilst we wait for uh, for Natalie to join, she's just had um, a slight issue in the milk bank where she's uh, where she's working, but she's about to join. But whilst uh, whilst we wait for her, um, maybe we can uh, ask some questions. I have a question for you, Miriam. Um, yes, you won't be surprised, um, but. In the meantime, let me just um, ask everybody uh, if you have a question, if you post it in the chat and we'll try and get a, an answer. I'm just writing that. I have to stop sharing my screen. Ooh, sorry. Um, how do I do? Partage it now. I don't know. Uh, uh, Krishna, can you help? Uh, where, uh, on top of your screen, where there is, a, you know, there is a red button that says stop sharing. On top of oh yes, oh yeah, yeah, 